ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Dr. Stephen Scott and his talk, You Can't Fix What You Can't See. Some people think that the most complex thing in the entire universe is the brain. Now, I, of course, think that's true because I study the brain. But I think we can all agree that the brain is very, very complex, and it can do so many different things. Right now, my brain is looking out at all of you in this crowd sitting in this room. And I perceive myself also standing, in this case, up on the stage all by myself. My brain stores memories from past and previous events. And right now, I'm using some of those memories to plan what I'm going to say next. And finally, my brain controls all of my muscles so I can talk, walk on the stage, use my hands for gestures to emphasize points. Now, all of these things require many parts of the brain, and they interact so that we can perceive, think, and move. Now, the problem is, if you get damage, even a very small amount of damage somewhere, all of a sudden you can have an enormous problem, either talking, thinking, or remembering. So if this happens, we go to the hospital, and the first thing they're going to do is try to find out what's wrong. Now, in the hospital, we have lots of fancy technologies. And there's lots there to diagnose injury and disease and to monitor patient care. Shockingly, there isn't a lot of technologies to assess the brain. Now, we have imaging, fMRI, and we get a nice picture of the brain to tell us about the structure. But if you want to know about the function, you don't have a lot of options. So how do we assess brain function? Well, we watch. We look. For example, we might ask a patient to touch their nose and touch the doctor's finger. And we watch to say, how well did they do that? And this works because we have this great ability to perceive even small changes in how we move. But here's the problem. Watching how you move doesn't allow you to see the whole picture. What about perceiving the world? What about perceiving yourself? What about memories? What about decision making? If I want to do daily activities like playing soccer or I want to go shopping for groceries, I need all of those different brain functions. If you can't see these, how can you treat them? At the end of the day, you can't fix what you can't see. So why isn't there technologies to assess the brain? What about robots? Now, I come by this question very naturally. I study the brain, and I look at how parts of the brain are involved in planning and making decisions. I'm a prof in the Department of Biomedical and Molecular Sciences. And I'm also, 25 years ago, invented a robot. The robot gets attached to your arm and allows you to move in the horizontal plane. We have a computer projection system, and it projects targets down into the plane. We can use the robot to make it feel like someone's trying to pull your arm off to the side, or we can make an object that you can hit, and it'll feel like a squishy squash ball. So we invented this, but the really hard problem was you've got to name it. So, Nothing in science is successful without acronyms. So, after a lot of work, we came up with KINAR. It stands for Kinesiological Instrument for Normal and Altered Reaching Movements. Now, you can never have enough KINARs. So we usually have one attached to your right arm and one attached to your left. And that way we can study your dominant, your non-dominant arm, and we can study how you work both hands together. With this, we have an environment. We can study motor skills, like how do you reach out to grab objects. And we get this enormous amount of precise information of how you're moving. And we use this to try to understand how different parts of the brain help plan and control body movements. Now, 
it was a really useful, it is a very useful device for me to do my research. But I also recognized that I would have a much more impact in science if I made it available for other people. So I started a company with a colleague and Queen's University as a partner. We started really small. It was just a side, of, side part of our lab. We got some small grants, we started improving the technology, and we started selling the robots to the research community. Now, Beacon, or Kinarm, we used to be Beacon, Kinarm, the company, is located in Kingston. It's about five kilometers from here. And it's got about 10 employees. Right now, we sell robots around the world, and Kinarm is now the most popular robot to study motor control and learning. Now, if this is such a good device for assessing brain function of healthy people, maybe we could study it to look at brain dysfunction. So here's the idea. Kinarm is just like every other technology in the hospital, like ultrasound or x-ray. A doctor sees a patient, thinks there's maybe a problem with their brain because of the disease or injury, and they send them off to another part of the hospital where the kin arm lives, and they ask for a set of tasks. Operator takes the patient, puts them in the kin arm, runs the tasks. The kin arm robot assesses and quantifies all the performance, and a report is sent back to the clinician. The doctor sees the information and that'll help facilitate the diagnosis or develop and help with the treatment plan. Now, I'm a bit of a nerd neuroscientist, so I had no idea of how the heck I was going to use this robot with patients. So it took a lot of trial and error over the last 15 years to figure out what we should do. And we kind of came up with five important things. Tip one. Time is your enemy. When I do an experiment in my basic research lab, simple task, it'll take 20, 30 minutes for me to collect all the data on a, on a subject, and I learned one thing about the brain. Now, if I want to assess a whole pile of motor skills, and I want to assess memory and perception and decision making, it could take hours and hours. So that's way too long. So we just had to kind of throw away what we had learned from doing using the robot for basic research, and decide we have to make tests that are as short as possible. Tip two, don't try to just replicate the existing clinical tests. If you have a stroke, it's really important that the doctor checks every part of your motor system. Can you move your fingers? Can you move your thumb, wrist, elbow, shoulder, and so forth? If I try to make a robot that can do all of that, it is going to be way too complex, too cumbersome, and way too expensive. Instead, we do a deep dive on the arm. We look at specific skills. We look at uh, goal-directed reaching. We look at fine motor skills by having them trace moving objects in the workspace. Or we can do bimanual skills where you make the two hands work together. On top of that, we use the arm as a readout of all the other parts of the brain perceptual systems, decision-making, and memory. So the idea is to try to make Kinarm a one-stop shopping for all things to assess about the brain. Tip three, always compare performance to what a healthy cohort or what does healthy look like. So if any of you went through the birthing process, you're probably familiar with age and height. There's a range of heights for each age, and as you grow older, it goes up. Brain function is the same thing. You have a performance, a task like reaching, and there's a normal range of how fast someone's going to move and how accurate you're going to be. So we collect lots and lots and lots of healthy individuals, and because factors like age impact how you perform, we collect from five to 95. In the end, what we can do is if you're a 69-year-old left-handed female, we can predict your performance based on what is expected for a 69-year-old left-handed female. Tip four, keep it simple, stupid. So the Kinarm robot, integrated virtual reality system, 
you can do wild and complex tasks. It's like the most expensive video game in the world. But simple is the best way to identify impairments. So when we do tasks, the simple tasks, what happens is healthy subjects have a very narrow range of how they behave. And with that nice narrow range, it's very easy for me to identify when someone's atypical and impaired. The last point is not a tip, but it's really an important factor. And that was actually Kingston. We have the university, we have the hospitals that are very close by, and we have a very collaborative environment that people work together. And as the result, we have one or more kin-arm robots in each of the three hospitals in Kingston. And we have a large team of researchers and clinicians looking and prototyping different ways of using the kin-arm robot for a diverse range of diseases and injuries. And this covers everything from acute care, rehabilitation, and outpatient care. It's truly a unique facility in the world. Now, at the end of this 15-year trial and trials of getting this to work, we've come up with something called kin-arm standard tests. It's a suite of behavioral tasks that study motor skills, perception, motor, uh, memory, decision-making. Each task is about three minutes, and they have very simple instructions. The robot automatically ass ass assesses and quantifies performance, and we can see right away how someone performs on each of the tasks. Now, probably the most interesting or enjoyable part of this journey is to see how the robot KinArm can be used to find all these interesting impairments that you can't see with the vis naked eye. Stroke commonly impacts motor function, but it can impact many other functions of the brain. One of these is position sense, the ability to know your position of your body in space. Now, if you want to test this clinically, you take your finger, you shut your eyes, the doctor will lift your finger up or down, and then you just say, did your finger go up or down? Some stroke subjects fail this task, but not that many. We use an arm matching task on the robot. And so what we do is first take vision away. We have the robot, and the robot will move the affected arm somewhere in the workspace. And they take their active arm, the other arm, and they mirror match. And then we go to another location and mirror match and so forth. With this task, we actually identify that 70% of subjects that have stroke will be impaired in this task. And importantly, the more impaired you are, the more difficult it is for you to do daily activities. So with colleagues in Calgary, we are now developing rehab tasks on the robot, trying to figure out ways that we can improve position sense again. So this is a kind of an example of now that we see it, we can try to fix it. Now, related to stroke is something called transient ischemic attack, TIA. And so this is individuals that have symptoms of stroke, but the symptoms disappear within 24 hours. And if you look at imaging, there is no signs of stroke. With a robot, we've been assessing these with a colleague, and actually we find out most of them have impairments 10 to 14 days later. One of the tasks we found the most useful for identifying impairments is called reverse visual guided reaching. Now, visual guided reaching is a task where we have a cursor positioned above the finger and it moves with the finger and we ask them to move to a red circle. It's very simple. Reverse visual guided reaching, we reverse the associations between the cursor and the finger so they go in the opposite directions. So now when you have to move the cursor to the circle, you have to go in the other direction. Now, everyone fails this the first trial, everybody. <laughs> But healthy individuals quickly learn not to do that automatic response to go to the target. And they quickly learn the rule, I've got to go the other way. TIAs have troubles and they continue to try to do this automatic response to go to the target. And they take longer to develop that new rule that I've got to go the other way. Now, you could say that's a pretty artificial task, but it's not that much different than a lot of daily activities. Uh, I use a mouse, you go like this, and the cursor goes vertical. I want to turn my car left or right, and I've learned that I turn clockwise or counterclockwise. And 
Even closer is if I have a small motorboat and I want to turn left, I have to make my hand go over to the right. So it is, these are the natural kind of associations between what we do in the world and how you have to control your body to make that happen. Parkinson's disease really impacts your ability to move. There's, there's no cure yet, but there are treatments. There's a drug treatment, L-DOPA. There's deep brain stimulation, and they do help people move better. But there are drawbacks. So a colleague of mine is working on this problem, and one of the tasks he's found useful was a task called Object Hit and Avoid. Now in this task, we have objects moving towards you in the workspace, and you have virtual paddles on your hands, and you're instructed to hit some targets. So let's say they're circles and triangles. So you have to hit those, they're targets, but there's also squares and rectangles, and they're also coming, and they're instructed do not hit those. Now, Parkinson's patients without any therapy or treatment, they are slow, they don't hit many targets, but they don't hit any distractors. They know the rule, they know what they're supposed to do. You give them treatments, they start to move faster. So they hit more targets, that's good, but they also start hitting the distractors, illustrating how the treatment actually creates impulsive behavior. So this is just an example of how the device KinArm could be used sort of to adjust medications so you get the benefits without the unwanted side effects. Probably the most interesting or surprising results has been with patients that don't actually have a brain impairment. They have diseases that impact other parts of the body. A group of researchers are looking at uh, kidney dialysis patients. These are patients that are going to be going through kidney dialysis, and their question they were interested in was, how much did the brain get impacted by the dialysis? So we started assessing these patients before they started dialysis, and my technician operators for the kin arm came in and they go, you know those kidney dialysis patients? They're not doing very well. And sure enough, even in the baseline tests before they started dialysis, many of these patients already had impairments in movement and in decision making. So perhaps if the dialysis started earlier, they wouldn't have had ended up with these neurological impairments. Kin Arms allows us a whole new, just a whole new way, a level of information about the brain that you can't see with the naked eye. Kinarm standard tests give us this behavioral fingerprint about a each individual patient's specific impairments. And the goal is with that, a doctor can, doctor can now generate a patient-centered therapeutic plan to deal with their specific Im impairments. The key is you can't fix what you can't see. And our ongoing research is really just the tip of the iceberg for what we think Kinarm could do for the healthcare system.